welcome to the third seminar. Welcome to the third seminar of the year. Today we have a very special guest uh, from our neighbor's institution, Professor Nuria Montserrat, who is a, a CREA professor and a senior group. Uh, in the past, she has been awarded an ERC starting grant and currently she holds a consolidator grant focus on the study of uh, the interplay between mechanobiology and metabolism during human kidney disease. And recently she has led a very important uh, research on the application of kidney organoid technology to model SARS-CoV-2 infections, where she and her collaborators identified a therapeutic compound that nowadays is under clinical trial in COVID-19 patients. And also recently she has been awarded at a young, an EMBO Young Investigator Prize. Thank you for being here with us. And Thank you, thank you for the, the kind invitation. And, and it's really my pleasure to be here. I was very curious to know a bit more about ISIC. Uh, being so close in Barcelona, and I'm very happy to, to, to have this presentation. And please do interrupt me at any time if you have any question or by the end of the session, it will be great. So um, also if for the young audience, some of you maybe have social accounts in Twitter, also it's good to be connected. So if you want to add us in our, in your, uh, social networks, that would be also a pleasure. And I will start with the presentation talking mainly about, uh, in general terms, about what had been the major understanding in the field of biology to, to try to, to, to hold expertise in the lab to uh, understand how tissues develop and how tissues get disease. And this slide is very, very general, but it's more, more to, to recall that in humans, we have very few capacity to regenerate our organs or tissues due to damage or injury. Whereas animal species, such as, uh, for instance, zebrafish or frogs, do have this capacity intrinsically to regenerate the structures. And in, in the middle picture, you can have, you see a, a picture of an nephron, which is the basic unit, of, the functional unit of the kidney. And these organisms already have the capacity to regenerate these very important structures after an, an insult. So in the field of biology, not, not only from 100 century ago or more than 200 years ago, but it has been always the question about how to understand biology and also to start to, to think more about, about how tissues develop. And, and in the field of, of stem cells, for instance, a major question has been to identify the specific cell source from where we can generate tissues in the, in the, in the laboratory. And, and if you have a, a look in this image, it, it represents the capacity of cells to differentiate. So in nature, the zygote is the only cell that has the capacity to give rise to a new, to new life. And this capacity is called totipotency. And in human, very soon in development, specifically from day five to six during uh, human gestation, we can, find, we can find in the embryo confined embryonic stem cells. And these cells have the capacity to give rise in vitro and in vivo to more than 200 cell types in our body. This capacity, as I mentioned, is referred as pluripotency. And as long as differentiation occurs, so development takes place in human, the capacity of cells to differentiate in some of the lineages is totally lost. So when we are adult, we have also somatic cells like fibroblasts or hair, uh, hair cells that do not have this capacity to differentiate into other cell types in our organism. So for many, many years, it was believed that it was not possible to convert fully differentiated cells into cells that have the capacity to give rise to any cell type, okay? So in the lab nowadays, uh, we and many others have the capacity to isolate those human pluripotent stem cells from embryos and also to develop ourselves in the lab artificially cells that have this capacity to be pluripotent, the so-called induced pluripotent stem cells. And I will go to this in, in the next slides. But before, mainly for the young audience, I will to stress that the fact that nowadays we can work with this type of cells, human pluripotent stem cells, is because of different discoveries. And I would like to highlight the discoveries that were made by these two uh, researchers that distant more than 60 years in time. So and by 2012, the, the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology was awarded to Professor Sinja Yamanaka and Professor Sir John Gordon for the discovery of human pluripotent stem cell technology or the development of induced pluripotent stem cells. And in the 50s, Professor Sir George Gordon was investigating indeed if cells 
fully differentiated could be converted into cells that were resembling to a totipoint cell, so a zygote. And the way that this professor did this experiment was to take a, a, a nuclei from a somatic cell, a differentiated cell, in this, case, in this case, intestinal cells from the frog, and transplant this nuclei into an enucleated oocyte of the frog. And by doing this, he could demonstrate that indeed uh, it could lead to the, 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 the born of a new frog. So it was the first time that it was believed that the capacity of cells to be reprogrammed could be achieved in vivo. Later on, this discovery led to the understanding about how to clone a species. And indeed, maybe some of you, you are very young, but this was the discovery of the sheep dolly. So a mam the first mammal that was ever cloned already in the 90s. Uh, some years after, uh, Professor Sinya Yamanaka was trying to understand if there were any factors in the cytoplasm of the zygote, so of the, of the oocyte, that could reprogram this nuclei. So he was trying to understand if he could identify transcription factors or molecules that were able to convert in vitro the nuclei of a somatic cell, of a fibroblast, into a pluripotent stem cell. And he did start overexpressing more than 25 transcription factors. And at the end of the experiment, he identified four transcription factors that are called Yamanaka factors nowadays, okay, by this professor, for this professor discovery. And by doing this, Professor Yamanaka, what he could show is that in only 20 days, by exposing these factors or expressing these factors ectopically in, in somatic cells, he could convert fully differentiated cells into cells that were pluripotent. So not totipotent, pluripotent, meaning that in the lab, now we have the possibility to generate these cells artificially that have the capacity to give rise to more than 200 cell types of our body if we know which are the coordinate instructions we need to give into these cell systems. So in the lab, uh, and, and not only ourselves, but many, many researchers, we have been trying to generate human pluripotent stem cells, either from human embryos or from somatic cell sources. And during my postdoctoral um, studies, I was trying to understand or identify safe methodologies to produce these, these cell sources, but also to start to develop approaches to generate cells that are resembling cardiomyocytes, so beating cells in the heart, hepatocytes, cells that work in the, in the liver. And the major aim of our research, of course, is to understand how nature gives rise to all these different cell sources to understand why tissues uh, end functioning uh, or malfunctioning in disease. So to develop a strategies to uh, have model systems to understand development and disease. So um, again, for the young audience, but also I think for all of us, uh, I also like to go back to history to tell you that Although these strategies look very fancy, already many years ago, other researchers from other fields were also having similar questions. How tissues develop? How an organ is formed? Why organs always have the same shape and the same function? So at the beginning of last century, the zoologist Harrison, he was trying to understand how sponges were formed in nature. And he was dissociating these marine sponges and putting single cells of these marine sponges in vitro in culture using this system that nowadays we use for doing our fancy organoids. So you see, even after 120 years, we didn't change much uh, the approach we have in the lab. By doing these experiments, the, uh, what was demonstrated that was that it was an intrinsic power in nature to organize cells in the, in the structures, in the tissues and in the organs. Following this understanding, other biologists uh, by the 50s, Moscona and Moscona, trying to understand how, for instance, the kidney was formed uh, in vivo, they were isolating kidneys from chick or mice embryo, dissociating uh, this, this rodiment or these embryonic kidneys with solutions and putting back these single cells in culture and analyzing ex vivo how these tissues again self-organize into a kidney ex vivo. Uh, and then also by the 50s, other researchers were developing strategies to culture tissue explants in the lab. Okay, then other approaches arrive, like the generation of artificial or natural extracellular matrix components to culture three dimensional uh, cells in three dimensional fashion. And later on, uh, uh, after the discovery of the capacity to culture mouse embryonic stem cells, researchers were trying to generate, as I mentioned before, as in my case, 
cells from scratch, so tissues from scratch, from pluripotent stem cells. And the seminal work of Yosiki Sasai uh, demonstrated that when he was culturing mouse embryonic stem cells in the presence of soluble factors that we know that are important for neural differentiation, and putting these cells in three-dimensional uh, culture system, he identified structures that appear and self-organized and were very similar to the, the, the shape that these structures have in the native organ. And this was the first time that the term organoid was referred to the capacity of cells to self-organize and lead to uh, the formation of these tissue structures. Later on, other researchers start to transfer this technology also starting from human pluripotent stem cells. So either human-induced pluripotent stem cells or human cells from derived from embryos. Uh, nowadays, uh, the field is exploiting or is, I think, in a, in a very good momentum. And, and we are many different groups in the world that we try to control externally the capacity that these cells have to self-organize and differentiate into different tissues. And in general, what we can assume or what we can uh, say when we refer to organoids is that these structures are three-dimensional cultures in where cells organize, especially very similar as we encounter in the native tissue. And that also uh, at some extent, the cells that we generate in the lab within these uh, cultures also have the capacity to recapitulate some specific organ functions. So how we do organoids in the lab, no? where to start from? So we copy from nature. We have uh, a lot of research done before about how, for instance, the kidney is formed in chicken or in mice model systems. And here you see different examples about how researchers, we try to understand a bit more about how to phenocopy this in the Petri dish. So starting generally from undifferentiated pluripotent stem cells, so human embryonic stem cells or iPSCs in these pluripotent stem cells, we expose these tissues in 2D fashion into morphogens or molecules that instruct these differentiation steps. And then at some point of the differentiation pro protocol, we do an aspheroid, a three-dimensional culture, and we continue exposing these model systems into morphogens or molecules that we know that perhaps have a very important function in the specification of this tissue. By doing this, you can see here that already we can find different approaches to generate kidney organoids, brain organoids, retinal organoids, among many others. So this is more or less a sum up of about what I would like to, to talk about you, with you today. So in the lab, we have been working for some years now, trying to understand how to generate these initial cell sources with different means, also to generate our own procedures to in, start instructing the differentiation of the cells in a two-dimensional fashion. And then exploiting the self-organization capacity that the cells have, we are starting to exploit the technology of organoids to model human disease. But we are also applying strategies from bioengineering to try to control this capacity that the cells already exhibit uh, at the very beginning. So I will, I will go into these different um, parts of the talk, but I cannot jump in the, in the talk without telling you very few words about the kidney. So how the kidney is formed in mammals. No? And this schematics refers uh, of the formation of this, uh, of this complex organ in the mice model system, because this has been the model that has been our goal standard for many, many decades. And I just want you to be uh, just maybe retaining two different concepts. So the kidney develops in mammals from a very small piece of tissue, which is called the intermediate mesoderm, that here is called with this IM. And at a very specific time point, the cells migrate inside of the embryo. So in here, you have the part of the embryo that will give rise to the head. And in here, you have the caudal part of the embryo that will give rise to the tail. So the position of the cells within the embryo is very important because the cells receive signal gradients from the neural tube, specifically retinoic acid gradients, or BMP gradients, so bone morphogenetic protein gradients from these structures that are called the somites. These are structures that will give rise to the muscles later on in development, okay? So when the cells receive these two different signals here, colored in green or in yellow, the cells will specify, differentiate a bit more, and then up to two days only in the in, in vivo, in, in the embryo, these structures now are differentiated into cells that are going to give rise to all the epithelial cells we have in the kidney, the, the nephrons, these functional units I showed you before, or in green, 
you have another progenitor cell, which is called the ureteric bud progenitor cell, UV in green, that give rise to all the collecting duct part in the kidney. So all these um, structures in the kidney that will take the filtrate for uh, secreting and finally excreting the urine from this organ. We know from uh, many years, from all these developmental studies, that the interaction between the metanephric mesenchyme and the ureteric bud cells, so these green and yellow structures, is very important for the proper formation of the kidney. And when mutations occur at some specific steps during kidney formation, we have congenital defects in the kidney, but also that the physical interaction among the cells also, even in the absence of mutation, leads to malformations in the kidney. So also telling us that the physical environment that the cells receive during embryogenesis is important for the development of, of this organ and of all the organs in our body, of course. So by 2012 and then, as I mentioned before, uh, we were having different projects in the lab in where we were trying to generate iPSCs or human embryonic stem cells to understand diseases in human. But by that time, it was any protocol, or they were any protocol for getting renal cells, so kidney cells in the Petri dish. So we took advantage of what I showed you before, all these steps that we know that occur during kidney embryogenesis or the formation of the kidney. And by doing a very naive approach, we try to phenocopy those, um, those signals that the cells receive uh, during embryogenesis. So we first expose our monolayers of culture cells, these colonies of iPSCs into these BMPs or FGFs. So mirroring the signals that the cells receive from the somite. And then we also expose up to two days the cell cultures into high doses of retinoic acid and active in A, which is an analog of this retinoic acid in culture to mirror the signals that the cells receive in the embryo from the neural tube. And by doing this simple approach in only four days, we analyze the cells by different means, confocal microscopy analysis, qPCR, and we observe that the cells do start expressing molecules of the renal field, so of the kidney field, meaning that we could instruct their differentiation into this cell type. And then we went back to bibliography to those seminal experiments I told you before. So if you take advantage of mouse embryonic kidneys at very early time points and put them back in culture, doing this uh, reaggregation and seeding them in this air liquid interface, this is what you get. So the cells will reassemble, self-organize without you doing anything in there, and then you will get this kidney ex rudiments ex vivo. So this is, believe me, very similar to what is inside of the animal in vivo, okay? So we can take advantage of this system. So then we interrogated what will happen if we re-aggregate our differentiated cells that we generate in only four days with these mouse embryonic kidney cells. Are we going to be able to have a system in where we can get a self-organized structure similar to the native kidney? So the first thing that we did was to take advantage of the non-differentiated cells. And as expected, they were any structure similar to the control condition. Whereas when we did re-aggregate our four days differentiated cells together with 90% of these mouse embryonic kidney cells, we could already observe similar structures. And if you remember well in the picture before, I show you these green cells that do a branch and, and lead to the collecting that. So we already could observe by eye, just in the microscope, that something was going on here. So if we level, then we level the cells with an antiviral vector for the expression of a green fluorescent protein to level our human cells. And we follow these cells in ex vivo. And we could localize the human cells or cells of the human origin in the branching tip of this uh, red structure that are level for cytokeratine. So this was the first time that we could at least generate our own procedure to generate cells of the renal lineage, so specifically the ureteric bud collecting duct system, okay? So this is just to tell you that we can, we, at least we could give uh, these kind of signals into the cells. So from that moment, many other laboratories, fortunately, start to exploit the human pluripotent stem cell technology to generate organoids uh, of the kidney, kidney organoids. Uh, and the way these authors uh, were doing this kind of experiments was to generate a progenitor cell, generally in seven to 10 days, in 2D phase, in culture, do an aspheroid and keep those aspheroids in the presence of different morphogens. The morphogens I told you before, those signals that lead to the formation of this kidney uh, in vivo. And by 2016, more or less, uh, you can have, you see here an example. So these procedures were lasting different timeframes from 23 to 30 days. 
and it was uh, in general uh, good good results meaning that uh, starting from undifferentiated cells we could generate these three-dimensional structures that when we do analysis uh, they did analysis sorry for by rna seq analysis for instance they observed that in 25 to 30 days these three-dimensional cultures were resembling the human fetal kidney of the first trimester so in very few time you can generate these structures although they are very embryonic but also by applying genome editing for example other authors were showing that you could indeed start to model human disease. By that time, I start my lab. So can you imagine I was uh, putting together a proposal telling that I will be doing organoid in my lab and then someone came and published a nature paper. So this is for you, the young people here, never give up and go on with your ideas. So then, as I mentioned, we did start our lab and, and then the, the hypothesis was that if we were going to be able to generate a true progenitor cell in a very short time period and force cell to cell contact and cell to cell it's a cellular matrix interaction in culture, we were going to force the differentiation extent as happened in the embryo in vivo. So we chopped the protocol uh, to get these intermediate mesoderm cells, the ones I showed you before in the schematics, and in only four days we could generate this progenitor cell that we also did expose to other morphogens, FGF9 and activin A. And then if our hypothesis was true and the cells have the capacity to self-organize and lead to the formation of any kidney structure, if we remove the factors from the, from the culture, so if we deplete the system of any external signal, the cells should be programmed correctly and lead to the formation to at least any nephron-like structure, right? So this is what we got. After 16 days in culture, we could observe that the structures were full of these nephron-like structures, well-segmented, and, and this happened in very short time frame. So then we start doing analysis, the type of analysis that we do, like uh, trying to, to see uh, until which extent our structures were differentiated compared with those other studies, and also with fetal uh, human kidneys. And we observed that in only 16 days of differentiation, our kidney organoids were similar to the fetal kidney of the second trimester. So by doing a very simple variation in the, in the way we do the differentiation by phenocoping better nature, we could really uh, have a big step in the extent of differentiation in our, in our kidney organoids. So we did a lot of characterization. This is an schematics for how a nephron looks like. No? So you have different segments of, in the nephron that are um, um, deceived by the expression of different proteins. So what we do here is to uh, analyze the expression of this protein and their localization comparing side by side. Uh, with the human fetal kidney of the 22 weeks gestation. But as we always say, nature does things perfect and we don't know yet how to uh, overcome or to phenocopy this. So if you have a look in our kidney organoids, even if the transcriptomic data tells you that they look very similar to a fetal kidney of the second trimester and that you have expression of many different proteins, this is what we see, for instance, for the endothelial cells. So very important cells if we ever want to transplant these kidneys or if we want to understand diseases that account in the kidney because of these particular cells. So as you see here, we have these cells colored here in magenta that express a protein which is called podocalyxin and this structure will give rise to the glomeruli. Okay, so the, the, the unit in the kidney that will do the filtration. So if you have a look in the human fetal kidney, the disposition of the cells is very different. So you have uh, in red, Inside of these structures, you have the, the, the endothelial cells, and we could not see this, no? So you get a structure in where the endothelial cells are scattered, scattered all over the place. So it was already something good, but it was not still so good as in nature, no? So then we said, okay, how can we uh, try to instruct the cells? How can we um, externally control how, to, how the cells are going to be finally located in these three-dimensional structures? And again, we took advantage of nature. So this is... This is an approach that had been used in the field of uh, developmental biology for more than 100 years now, by now. Uh, and this model is the chicken chlorantonic membrane assay. So you can have an egg uh, uh, with a chick embryo and the membrane that uh, is going to be feeding the embryo is full of vessels that are growing during embryonic gestation, right? So in the field of biomaterials, this assay has been used for, for example, for engrafted biomaterials and to see how the this membrane, which is very uh, naive in terms of immunoresponse, reacts to these scaffolds. So other researchers, for example, are putting here cancer cells 
and this um, system acts as an innovo bioreactor. So it provides a microenvironment and a fluid flow in natural that the cells can grow and um, become metastatic. No? So we say, okay, let's engraft our kidney organoids and see if we can organize the endothelial cells that we have inside of these structures because this system is fully open. We can even work with this in a very uh, amenable manner. And we are going to be needing very few animals also for these approaches. So what we did in here, was to engraft our kidney organoids and then recover the samples after three or five days. And this is the type of experiment. So you see here in this arrow, this tiny thing here is an organoid surrounded by blood vessels of the chicken. And in here, you can indeed inject uh, fluorescent molecules like this dextran pitsy. And if you uh, take advantage of uh, or reconstruct different uh, images from confocal microscopy, the first observation we have in here is that as expected, the chicken vessels were entering in our structures here color it in blue. So if we now do consecutive section in analysis uh, of, of these organoids after implantation, now we see that these 34 cells, the ones I showed you before that were totally scattered all over the place of the organoid, were encountered as we expect in nature. So inside of those agglomerular-like structures. And this never happened in the situation in vitro at that time, okay? Also, we were measuring the the, the length of the structures that were forming inside of the organoid, confirming that this approach acts as an innovo bioreactor in only five days. So in, in the field of biomaterials or, or bioengineering, uh, we know that not only the composition of the, of, the, of the surrounding tissue, but also the biophysical cues that the cells receive during uh, embryogenesis is important for the development of organs. So, we wonder what was the stiffness of this chicken cam, of this uh, in, in, in material or this membrane in vivo. No? So we have a collaboration with Professor Xavier Trepat that did measure for us the stiffness of the chicken cam. And as expected, the stiffness was very soft, 1.2 kilopascals, but something that we can do in the lab is to do uh, hydrogels with polyacrylamide in where we can fine tune the stiffness of the substrate. So then we hypothesized that if we were going to be generating our kidney organoids from cells exposed to a soft microenvironment, even if we have these molecules I told you before, probably we were going to generate even better kidney organoids. So this is what we try to do. We uh, were doing our procedure of differentiation, uh, taking advantage of this <clears throat> polyacrylamide hydrogel, so uh, ranging from different stiffness from one to 60 kilopascals. And in the soft microenvironment or the soft uh, condition, kidney organoids start developing faster these nephron-like structures. And when we analyze at the level of qPCR, for example, we observe that this, the organoids generated in this soft condition were also exhibiting higher uh, terms of differentiation. When we implant again this uh, organoid generated in a soft microenvironment in the taking advantage of this approach I told you before, this is a 10 microscopy analysis. I don't, go, I don't want to go into detail, but we could observe that now when we do the implantation, not only uh, we can find better disposition of endothelial cells in the structure, but also that very specialized cells like a podocyte cell already start exhibiting at the level of ultrastructure, very important properties that we know that are needed for function uh, in, in the kidney. So as I mentioned before, we want to, do, uh, we want to copy as much as possible the, the physical environment, but also the composition of the tissue for trying to understand a bit more how to program our cells to lead to the formation of these organoids. And in the field of bioengineering, already from the 70s, last century, I look like a very grandmother, but I want to tell you that you need to also go back and forth all the time to biography to see what others have been doing, okay? So we, we try to, to really understand if we can generate our own materials for instructing better differentiation. And as I mentioned before already by the 70s, several approaches were uh, depleting cells out of tissues. And what, what, is, what is known already is that if you take an acellular scaffold, for example, a uh, rhesus monkey kidney, so um, a kidney from, from monkeys, and you deplete this kidney of cells and you slice the extracellular matrix of this kidney, uh, and you put in just in contact human embryonic stem cells, the cells will start expressing molecules of the kidney. So meaning that the properties of the biomaterial, this, called, this is called biomimicry, meaning, meaning, meaning that the extracellular matrix proteins already are dictating the, the destination of the cell, okay? So why we don't use this approach, for example, for generating our own biomaterial? So this is what we do in the lab. 
we can take advantage of discarded kidneys from humans or, or, from, or from pigs. We remove the cells out of, this, um, of these tissues. And then we do the typical characterization just to see at the level of structure that the, the preservation of the structure, you can see here glomeruli or tubuli, which are very well preserved. And also what we then do is like uh, we starting from this uh, cellular material, we can generate our hydrotels and after characterization, uh, we are starting to understand a bit more the properties of this uh, natural material. So something that is already to live is on the properties of these uh, cellular matrix proteins to home uh, vessels or of angiogenesis to, to produce more vessels in the, in the organs. No? So we engraft these materials in the presence or absence of these um, different formulations of this material, sorry, again in the chick model system. And we see that when we, we put in the material these uh, cellular derived hydrogels, we have um, a better uh, endotelization of the, of the material itself. So now uh, we are taking advantage of this approach for encapsulating our progenitor cells to, to try to produce organoids in a better and high throughput manner. So now we can go for the production of very small organoids, micrometer size to millimeter size. But something that is for us more important is on the generation of these endothelial-like cells in the presence of this material. So as I mentioned before, we don't know much about the mechanism. We are now trying to understand, but we see that this approach is really helping us to produce organoids with, with a higher or enhanced endothelial compartment. Another nice property of human pluripotent stem cells, uh, it, it's on the possibility to take advantage of these cells to perform genome editing. So uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the CRISPR-Cas9 technology or other uh, approaches to modify uh, the genome of the cells, but human pluripotent stem cells can be kept cultured in, in single cells, and these cells are very resistant to stress. Uh, whereas if I take, we take, for example, cells that are differentiated, the ones I told you before from the hair or from the skin, we have very few time for doing genetic manipulation because the cells enter very fast into senescence and they acquire uh, different mutations so we cannot manipulate them so great, at least with Cas9. Now with, uh, with other endonucleases like Cas12 or base pair uh, genome editing, things are, are becoming easier. But to make a long history short here is that we can introduce in the genome of the cells, the cells have safe carbos locus, so um, places in the genome that we can introduce uh, um, changes in the sequence, and we know that the overall performance of the cell won't be affected, okay? So we can modify the genome of the cells, and what, what was shown by a, a, very, a very nice uh, Ramonica Hall that was in my lab until last year, uh, by Federico Gonzalez Grassi when he was doing his postdoc in Sloan Kettering in New York, he could demonstrate for the first time that he could occupy uh, this one of the safe carbos locus of the cells to modify the genome and to generate cells that have different properties, like incorporating mutations important for patients or doing reporter cell lines. So when Federico came into the lab, we were we want to repurpose the approach to do this in genetic engineering, and we were generating. Uh, heterozygous or homozygous lines that have, uh, in where we have inserted the module for expressing Cas9 under the Teton system, which is uh, uh, a system in where you put a doxycycline, for instance, in, in the media, and the cells will express Cas9, so now the cells are ready to, to make genome editing. So by doing this, we can repurpose this platform for uh, doing uh, our patient-specific cell lines or reporter cell lines uh, targeting genes, genes that are important for us to understand better how they behave uh, during the formation, for instance, of kidney organoids or retinal organoids. So this is the powerful of this platform. So now this is an example about the type of results that you get. So when you uh, do genetic modification, you will have a readout, which is the change in, in, in the sequence, of course, but then you, you can be using different guide RNAs. Uh, for doing this genetic modification. And in the lab, we have been generating a lot of different cell lines that are knockout or knock-in for a specific molecules that are of our interest for understanding uh, kidney disease. So this is just an example of a wild-type organoid for a, a gene, which is very important for tumors in the kidney. So as expected, at day 12 of differentiation, our kidney organoids are exhibiting the typical morphology that we know very well. So these are these dimensional cultures. In different colors, you have the formation of these rounded structures, which are called renal vesicles, and the structure looks like a control situation. Whereas when we do the genetic modification, we see 
a total change in the structure and that the, the cells are not currently programmed to give rise to any nephron-like or renal vesicle structure. This is a kidney organoid, for example, at the 20 of differentiation in where we can see that the organoid is fully equipped. So having the different components that we expect. Uh, and then when we have a, a look for the same molecules in the mutant, we do see that there is no formation of any nephron-like structure at this time. This is just for, for showing you on the powerful of this type of approaches to compare wild type and knockout situation or knock-in situation, and then to start interrogating for those defects that are related in this case for this particular cancer, but also for, for many other disorders now in the lab. So by more or less, as you know, no, we are very tired of this, but by the, by the beginning or the end of December uh, 20, 2019 and beginning of December, uh, COVID-19 disease became uh, a major problem all over the world. And, and, and then in February, indeed in Barcelona, we were having in 2020 a conference that we did organize in my institute together with MBL. And we invited several people, and in the audience, it was a man that did discover that ACE2 was the receptor for SARS-CoV-1 coronavirus already by 2005. And, and we knew already that uh, the receptor for SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, because now we know that ACE2 is the receptor for SARS-CoV-1, uh, has uh, a very important role in many metabolic tissues, but very specific, important role in the kidney. So we were discussing in the conference because we were observing that a lot of papers that appear by uh, 2020 February, were taking advantage of monkey cells for growing the virus. And, and the predictions of the sequence was, was telling us something important about how the virus was using H2 receptor, but we were not having any human model system to study at least viral tropism or to make any question about how the virus was infecting human cells. So together with Joseph, we, uh, we said, okay, uh, maybe it's time to try out Indeed, Joseph uh, already uh, by 2019, he also showed that it was possible to generate vascular, vascular organoids. So uh, organoids like the ones I showed you before, but mainly composed of vascular cells. And we know that also vessels in, the, in, in our body do express a lot of ACE2. And Joseph told me that already he was having a collaborator in Karolinska Institute by 2020 that was already isolating SARS-CoV-2 uh, viral particles from a patient diagnosed with, for COVID-19. So then when we end up the conference, we start like analyzing our kidney organoids and start shipping kidney organoids from Barcelona to this third collaborator I didn't know about. Um, and then we put in place a, a, a very uh, fruitful collaboration during the pandemics. And this is just something I told before. So we know that ACE2 is expressed in different organs and specifically in the tubular cells in the kidney. I showed you before an schematic of a nephron. You are having a glomeruli and then you have this tubular structure which are, is composed of many different cells which are called tubular cells. And about this tube, only in cells of, of a specific location of this tube, S1, S2 or S3 segment that refers to the position of the cells, we have the expression of this S2 in the kidney. So then we hypothesize, okay, maybe if we can really see that the virus uh, infects our organoids, we can test on the efficacy of a compound that already was, uh, was uh, relieved uh, because the, this uh, person, Joseph Penninger, already by 25, he identified ACE2 as the major uh, door for SARS-CoV-1 to infect cells. So together with companies, he developed this molecule uh, that is a human soluble recombinant protein for ACE2. Uh, and this, uh, this molecule was already tested in patients with uh, lung uh, disease. So we say, okay, let's try to see first if this virus infects our kidney organoids, and then we try this molecule and see if we can block at least the infection in vitro. So as I mentioned before in the lab, before COVID arrived, we were having, as all of you know, a lot of different projects, and we were investigating, for instance, in converting our protocols of differentiation, taking advantage of uh, a culture system, which is called uh, a liquid interface into free floating conditions. So we were doing a lot of characterization and this is just a, a representation of the type of data you get from single cell uh, RNA-seq and uh, demonstrating that these kidney organoids following this procedure, a bit different as the one I showed you before by 2019, we could generate kidney organoids in uh, 60 days again. And, and we can observe by different colors how the cells do cluster uh, depending on the, on the level of expression of different, of different markers. And what this plot is telling us here 
is that we have uh, uh, cells within the organoids that resemble cells of the proximal tubuli. So the cells I told you that express ACE2, cells that are expressing markers for the podocytes, the endothelial cells, and so on. So then if we interrogate for the expression of ACE2 in our kidney organoids, we do see in red here, the, the more red it is, the more expression you have. So in, in red here is the cells that do express higher level of ACE2, which correspond to the cells in the proximal tubuli. And in this uh, image is the cells that are here in green, okay? So we say, okay, let's start shipping this, as I mentioned before. So we were putting our organoids in planes and then Alimi Razimi by 2020, February, he already could isolate and propagate SARS-CoV-2 viral particles and do some sequencing in there to, to identify the, cl the clade uh, from where this viral strain was belonging to. So uh, in the BCL3 room in Karolinska, they were infecting our kidney organoids with different doses of the virus and they could detect mRNA expression of the virus as expected, but also more importantly, when they took the supernatan of the infected kidney organoids, they could reinfect other cells and other organoids, meaning that the system also lead to viral progeny, which is important for um, viral tropis analysis. And then when we expose the, the organoids to the to this compound, the human recombinant soluble ACE2, which in, in the name of this molecule, the commercial name is APN01, uh, we could observe in a dose-dependent manner that the, the mRNA of the level uh, was decreasing. And this molecule indeed after this, um, this, uh, this paper was also tested in, in, in patients with COVID-19 uh, by the same year, leading to good results. So then, Again, no. Uh, in the lab, we work with the kidney organoids, and we have an, another another model systems, and and we know that we can, as I showed you before, interrogate about how a change in the sequence in the genome uh, may affect the phenotype, as I showed you for the example of WT1. So we can have control con control condition versus a um, a knockout condition, and see what is different, and to interrogate for mechanisms of disease. But also in the lab, for the last years. We want to exploit the, kidney, the organoid technology to investigate on systemic conditions that affect the organs. So, for example, what our systemic condition is, is type 2 diabetes. No? A, a bad control on glucose in the tissues, we know that is very harmful. So <clears throat> the direct effect of glucose in tissues leads to many changes that are related with changing composition in the cellular matrix. And in the kidney in particular, uh, type 2 diabetic patients do develop a disease which is called diabetic nephropathy, so diabetic kidney, in where it has been a lot of research in there, uh, and, and we know nowadays different clinical symptomatology in the kidney. So you have uh, fibrosis in the kidney um, and different changes in the organ at the functional level. So we want to understand a bit more, and, and by that time, we start this project already by 2017 with a Marie Curie Fellowship and many, many other students in my lab to try to put in place a culture system, very simple culture system that was allowing us to study those phenotypical changes that may occur during the first step of, of diabetic kidney exploiting this technology. So when COVID-19 disease emerged, uh, we were also listening a lot about that type two diabetic patients were having a worse prognosis in COVID-19. So then, Again, no, I want to put a bit more my research on that because we want to really know a bit more about how not only the virus infects the, the kidney organoids or the blood vessel organoids, but also to see the interaction among different things, right? So how impairments on glucose metabolism is affecting a viral infection. And if we identify those mechanisms, maybe we can block those malfunctioning pathways to block viral infection, no? So then uh, we wonder, sorry, if we could exploit uh, <clears throat> the platforms that we have in the lab to understand a bit more about if any interaction at the mechanistic level between viral infection and, and uh, glucose uh, metabolism. So as I mentioned, this was not new because we were working for a long time in the lab. So we are having this procedure for getting organoids now in suspension, the ones I showed you before. So we, can, uh, we have this protocol very well characterized, and we know that at day 16, the kidney organoids are equipped with cells of the tubular glomerular compartment. And then what we did after several trials in here is to expose our kidney organoids to 5 to 25 millimolar glucose in oscillating fashion. And why we do this is because we know that kid, um, diabetic patients, before diabetes is diagnosed, there is a problem in how to control these oscillating levels of glucose in, in your body. Okay, 
So we know that the, the non-control um, of these oscillations is harming tissues. And then as a control condition or normoglycemic condition, we use this condition, which is five millimolar glucose in, in the media. <clears throat> Sorry. So then uh, to have a system in where we can interrogate for a defect related to what you are, in, what you are using in, in, in your culture system, the first thing that we did was to interrogate on the effect of these culture conditions in the extent of differentiation. So we observe that there were any change in the extent of differentiation. So meaning that the kidney organ is exposed to this normal glycemia or uh, oscillating glycemia are more or less similar in terms of differentiation also by confocal microscopy analysis and by other means. And then we were also uh, trying to see if some of these hallmarks that we know that occur during diabetes in the kidney also account in our kidney organoids. And I mentioned before about the maldeposition of the cellular matrix proteins in the kidney, in the native kidney in patients. And this is just one approach. You can count and, and or measure uh, the collagen expression or other, market, other uh, ECM related proteins. And we see that in the 25 millimolar oscillating glucose conditions, we do have a higher deposition of, of collagen. And, and also more importantly, we know that in diabetic mice, for example, or in diabetic patients, you have an increase in the expression of H2. And where? In the tubular cells. So I mentioned before about these tube cells where the H2 is expressed. So in diabetic patients without COVID or in diabetic mice, we know that H2 is highly expressed. So to confirm that our platform was successfully going to tell, tell us something more about uh, how to model this uh, COVID-19 disease in this background, we analyzed for the expression of H2 in normal glycemic or hyperglycemic exposed kidney organoids. And as you can see here, we detect more expression of H2 in the oscillating glucose condition, also by Western blood and qPCR, but also that the half lifetime of the mRNA of H2 was increased in the, in the, in the diabetic condition. Okay. So then we did uh, put in place our collaborate, collaboration with another young researcher in Heidelberg University, Steve Bulan. So he's one of the labs in, in Europe that they can do single cell RNA-seq within the BCL3 or the BCL4 uh, room. So we were doing this analysis and we reconfirmed uh, on, on our hypothesis so that the kidney organoids exposed to these diabetic-like conditions were more infected. We also could reconfirm this, and this is a bit old image because now we have been doing we have been doing uh, the revision of this manuscript. So we could observe that also when we analyze for the expression of the nuclear protein of the virus in red, we detect more expression of the of the nuclear protein of the virus in the in the condition of uh, diabetic-like condition. Sorry, and here what we did then is to ascertain on the, on the true role of H2 in this system. So I told you before that with CRISPR-Cas9 technology, you can do knockouts. So what we have been doing here is to do knockouts for H2. So the cells don't express H2 anymore, but we can still differentiate these cells into kidney organoids. So wild type organoids do express H2. You can see here this in green. Knockout organoids do differentiate the knockout line, sorry, into kidney organoids, but they don't express this H2. And at the level of expression for other markers uh, of the renal lineage, this, the organoids behave normally. So when we infect organoids in, that don't express H2 or express H2 with the virus, we can see that in the absence of H2, there is no infection. And this is the first genetic evidence in human that H2 is important for viral infection because there had been other proteins or other gates in the human um, cells that had been stated for the last year, uh, two years to be important for viral infection. And we have been doing knockouts for all of these um, different receptors, including neuropilin one or basigin, among others. And these are images of stem microscopy analysis. And we can see that this is very qualitative, we know, but at least in the knockout conditions, we cannot detect uh, viral particles in there. So then to go and, and, and confirm this hypothesis also in, in the human cells. So we have this lasting collaboration with Hospital Clinic in Barcelona we can uh, isolate cells from uh, kidney biopsies uh, from non-diabetic and diabetic patients. And we have been doing this in the context of those projects before the pandemics. So these are just different analyses because we are very interested in the metabolism that this, so in the, in the metabolic profile of these cells. So cells that come from a diabetic microenvironment, uh, how they breathe, how they express metabolic regulators that are important for mitochondrial biogenesis as for instance, PGC1 alpha or CPT1A. And all these hallmarks 
very nicely we could replicate in the kidney organoid. So by exposing our kidney organoids into those conditions I show you, and we go for this type of analysis, we do see that the kidney organoid replicates these impairments in the, in the mitochondrial biogenesis and others. No? So then what happens if we infect non-diabetic and diabetic kidney cells from patients into, with SARS-CoV-2? So as we hypothesize, there is more viral susceptibility. So there is more susceptibility for viral infection in a diabetic milieu. And this, we, we have been uh, doing this uh, revision for the last six months, and we have been also testing um, compounds that are uh, either uh, boosting or inhibiting glycolysis or oxidative phosphorylation in the kidney organoids and in the uh, patient cells. And we have identified one or two uh, molecules that by applying this during infection, we don't see an infection. So correlating the importance between metabolism and infection, something that is known in other viral uh, uh, infections and viral systems, but not uh, as, as we know so, so far for SARS-CoV-2. So this is my last slide. So I would like to point that in the lab, we have been working for some time now with this kidney organoid, but going from very, you know, as I show you know, some very questions about developmental biology, how the system develops, how these uh, cells are formed. And also we have the same approach for cardiac organoids, retinal organoids. And in the context of COVID, we have been also doing quite a lot of research on gastric and blood vessel organoids. But as we always say, this field is still very new. So I, I was showing you all pictures, all studies you know, about research for the last uh, 100 years and something. And still, we don't know how nature really instructs differentiation. So what we try to do is to um, to provide microenvironments at the physical or the, or the biochemical composition of the microenvironment to instruct better differentiation. And we know we can do things better. For example, with microfluidics, we can expose or we can um, introduce other aspects like fluid flow, shear stress in our, in our organoid systems. Also, we take advantage of these tissue engineering approaches like using these cellular materials. And at the end of the day, our main goal is to develop these systems for applications in disease. No? So one of our, of, of our main um, diseases of interest are these systemic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, which is a major problem nowadays in our, in our countries or congenital defects because we can do these uh, genetic modifications in the kidney organoids. So this is the most important picture of my, of, of my talk today. Uh, these are the members of my group. Some of them, like Patricia, she defended the thesis uh, several months ago, and now she's uh, out of the lab after five years. And Andres will defend his thesis uh, by the 14th of March, and Lucia already left to, uh, for after defending the thesis uh, one month ago. And, and some members of the lab that are very important, like Elena, and also collaborators in my institute. Uh, this network of people that I didn't know before pandemics, but now we are really uh, friends together and working a lot on the COVID-19 projects. And of course, uh, collaborators here in Spain that are helping us with the single cell RNA analysis and the funding agencies. And thank you very much for your attention. And sorry if I've been uh, talking too much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Now the floor is open for questions. We'll start asking about the how repro I mean how the results that you obtain when you try these uh, compounds with the kidney organoids in comparison with, for example, when you try it in vivo with mice, the results are similar or there are some. So you mean the concentrations we use comparing uh, for getting the organoid, like no, when you try the, the compound, like the pharma? No? Ah, yeah. We don't know because we didn't test this, for, for example, this last compound, the DCA or others in the, for blocking infection. We didn't try that yet in the, in the mice model for uh, COVID-19. So everything has been done in vitro, but we have been taking uh, into consideration before doing the experiment, what is known for these molecules in other systems like tubular cells or in vivo systems. So we do the other way around. So we <laughs> diminish the concentration of the molecules, yeah. Is there any ethics concern about fabricating these organoids? No, because everything is very well regulated, no? So at the level of uh, European uh, legislation, we have a, a similar framework, but, but specifically in Spain, we follow the law by 2004 and then the, the new law by 2007. 
that dictates the use and generation of pluripotent stem cells from embryos or iPSCs. So the law considers that human embryonic stem cells, so the ones we derive it from embryos, iPSCs, the ones we derive it by reprogramming, or gametes, so sperm or oocytes, they have all the same moral entity. So we need to have our projects approved by a, a committee, which is having the, the, the committee in Catalonia. And then we send this protocol to Madrid, the Commission of Guarantees. So we have very strict, um, very strict uh, committees in there with a lot of feedback for us. And, and then at the same time, now Spain has changed this law. So now IPSCs won't have this moral consideration anymore because they are reprogrammed. Uh, but this has been for us the, the, the working day of the last uh, almost uh, 15 years. And at the level of Europe, you have uh, uh, green or orange or red countries. So for example, in Italy, it's nowadays it's still forbidden to work with human stem cells derived from human embryos. And here we can do this because they are donated for bio, biomedical research. So the, the parents consent that the, the embryo will be used for this type of approach and they have a consent form you explain the project and they consent that if they have any discarded embryo, that will be used for generating human embryonic stem cells. But in, in Italy, this is not possible. Whereas you have other countries like UK that were pioneering on uh, human embryonic stem cells development and so on. So there is no much about, about it because then in, in these projects, no, you have then also the European um, framework. So once you get your protocols, approve it, Catalonia, Madrid, Guarantees Commission. I need to send all these documents to Belgium. I to Belgium to Brussels. There is another committee in there that will give the green light to the project. And yeah, this can take one year. Yeah, yeah. But at least you work in a in a in a framework in where you know that you have been having a lot of uh, a lot of oversee from from many different points of view because these committees are composed by philosophers, nurses, scientists. So. You have a lot of feedback. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Thank Hi. you for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask uh, something related to the previous question. Uh, what do you do after uh, the experiments with the cells? Then you. How do you discard them? How you discard what? Sorry. How do you discard the cells after finishing the experiments? How I trash them? Yes, and the little organelles that were generated. No, we don't. I mean, we don't trash. We <laughs> we process. So you either do the qPCR analysis or you either do the PCA, and then we can biobank these organoids. But uh, these organoids, for example, the ones the kidney organoids. Um, they are not, um, so far the technology, we cannot freeze them. So every time we do them, uh, the lifespan goes with the experiment because you can, it is not like colon organoid, but you can freeze, thaw and expand, okay? So we kept the sample, the, the original sample. So you can put back in a biobank the paraffin, but not the live tissue because it has a lifespan. You cannot go on with that. But the law in Spain, the law uh, does not dictate that you need to buy your bank or put this at the uh, at the disposal of the scientific community. It's a recommendation. If you are asking me for this, I don't know. Uh, and, and then generally, these organoids I'm, I'm showing you with today, they come from cells, not from patient biopsies. So imagine that I do this kind of research and I do a start from a biopsy from a patient, I do isolate and then the law tells you that you can do this with discarded material or with material that the patient has consent to give to this type of research. And then the law dictates how to discard this material, not me, no, not the, not the research group. And then if the, if the organoid comes from a patient, as I mentioned before, uh, you can put it back in a biobank. So in the primary source that has given to you the biopsy. And this is the manner that you can recirculate the sample. But for most of these technologies, organoids, uh, you have very few procedures to freeze uh, the organoid and to make it immortal. So 
only for nowadays, maybe in five years everything changes, but for colon organoids, not for lung organoids, not for brain organoids. So we don't have technology, this is five years or six years. Um, so what you kept and what you, you kept with you, like the paraffins or everything, it's only available during the lifetime of the project. So if my ERC ends 2020, like ERC is starting, okay, if I need to go back and use my own material, I need to tell to get again the consent, you know, so it's, hey, there is very, I mean, it's very strict. You cannot, uh, you cannot imagine. Hey. And I have another. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you put uh, the cells and then they start to mimic the environmental. And that I wanted to know if maybe you better know or not, if this behavior is just common in mammals or it also could it be spread in other organisms or um, besides plants. I listen very bad, sorry. It's not, it's not because of you, it's because of me. I, I cannot listen very well. So you mean that if these molecules that are expressed are only expressed in mammals, you mean? Talk about the environmental mimic. Uh, and I wonder that if this just common in mammals or it also could be presented in other organisms as uh, whatever, or also on plants. Yeah, so in the context of the kidney, you know, for having the a similar context, um, the kid is very interesting organ indeed because in evolution, um, in the philia of animals, so I will talk, not plants, okay, in animal, in animal philia, in the animal reg, in, the, in the reino animal, no, in, in, so you have different philia, uh, different philiums of, of of these animals, and then you have like fishes, birds, and then mammals. So depending on the on the on the time that the animals have been in in in, in the world in in the earth, the the kidney has been adapting to the environment. So for example, what does it mean that in the in the fish you have a tube? Yes, that's it. It's called the mesonephros. Our kidney is called the metanephros. Okay, it's more evolutionized. So the more evolutionized it is, because it's adapted differently to the environment, you lose properties in regeneration. So the kidney of a fish, which is this kind of very rudimental structure, this tube can regenerate after damage. Our kidney cannot, but the, and also the complexity of our kidney is very different from a fish and from a bird. Okay, but then uh, what I'm telling you this also is because for some, for some type of, of cues, we cannot really compare because the system is kind of different. It's called kidney, but it's different in, in embryonic terms, okay? But something which is very interesting for me is that in our development, when you were an embryo, uh, your kidney, now it's a metanephric kidney, but during development, you have gone for pronephros, mesonephros, and metanephros. So during the mammal development, the kidneys goes for all the transitions from the very rudimentary kidney, which is called pronephros, a very rudimentary tube, a mesonephros, which has some properties of the final kidney that we have, and then the metanephros. And where are these structures now? Because you have your metanephric kidney, no? So these are lost during embryogenesis. They, uh, how is this word in English? They, uh, they die. And this happens in the embryo. So you have a moment in the embryo, uh, which is called hyperplasia. So all the structures will be uh, generating and growing. And then you have an hypoplasia, which is that they grow. So when you have in, in human, it goes from month one to the month three, you have an hyperplasia. And then from day four, month four to month nine, you have this hypoplasia. So these structures, rudimentary structures in the kidney get lost. But the kidney is very interesting model system. That's why it had been very well studied because you can, you can extract, as I mentioned before, no? the, the kidney from this mice, no? from this embryonic mice. If you take it at day 8.5, it's very similar to the one in the fish. If you take it in 8.5, very similar to the birds. And then from onwards, metanephric. No? And the more evolutionated it is in terms of function, the less regenerative it is. So it's a very, that's why we love it. It's a very nice system for studying all these kind of evolutive questions as well, no? The same happens for the heart. So it's difficult sometimes to have 
a same question using different model systems because the, the embryonic nature is also very different. I don't know if I answer your question, but. Someone else? Anna? Anna, are you there? Anna? Yes, there are no online questions. Thank you. Ah, great talk, thank you very much. Uh, what about, so you, you try to model uh, disease, but I suppose also you want to make an organelle that would be used in a human transplanted. How far are we from uh, this? Yeah, I think we are, I mean, I will only talk about the research we do. I cannot talk about other people's research because you have different labs with different approaches and, and for the type of research we do with the kidney organoids, we are still far to get something like it's transplantable. But in terms of time, we, we are in a very good moment in the sense that in very few time we have gone from needing 30 days to need maybe the less of time. We can get better structures. We can differentiate it better. But here you have many different um, uh, cavities no? or, or, or draw wax. Uh, if you want to transplant whatever you generate in the lab, you need to have a prevascularization. So these red cells I was showing you before, and this in the field this is still a major problem. So how to prevascularize these this, uh, organoids. Another uh, important thing in here is the, um, the innervation. So all the tissues in our bodies have innervation and they are connected. No? So this is something that we are trying to understand now. So how can we innervate or not at all <laughs> our systems? Um, so for the kidney, I think it's going to be complicated because we are starting with a very um, picky demonstrator. No, You have more than 22 one different cell types in your kidneys, uh, more than 1 million nephrons in each kidney, more or less. The size is quite big. It's a parenchymal tissue. You need innervation, vascularization, and so on. But for other types of organoids, like um, intestinal organoids, they have been already transplanted in phase one clinical trials for Crohn's disease. So I think that depends on the type of, of application and depends on the type of question you have, you may find good solutions. So the type of kidney organoids we do generate are mainly composed of these nephron-like structures all over the place. Uh, and one approach can be to fuse organoids we can fuse them different blocks, right? Um, and then we can construct a better uh, and bigger structure. Then we have the problem of the um, suppliate uh, nutrient supply if the structure goes too large. So then we can put microfluidics in there. So I think not myself, not our group, but other groups in MIT that we know very well in Harvard or many others, no? they are going into this approach more on, on transplant transplantable um, structures and I think the field is progressing very very quickly but for the kidneys I think we still need some time yeah thank you okay thank you again for accepting our invitation for this nice talk thanks to you